Okay, now I would like to introduce second speaker, uh, Professor Jeff Valence from Athabasca University, Canada. I think he's not here, but there. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Dr. Valence, are yeah. you ready? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, oh, gosh, oh, there okay. I am. <laughs> yeah. uh, have have dinner. It's just <laughs> around six o'clock there, right? Yeah, seven o'clock for me. Oh, okay, okay. So, are you ready? So, uh, please, yeah, please welcome uh, Professor Valence. He's going to talk about going beyond the data, how sample characteristics may limit generalizable. Uh, Okay, let me try again. Generalizability <laughs> in evidence on uh, exercise oncology, please. Okay, how does that look? Yeah, it looks great, yeah. Great, good. Thank you for uh, that introduction and, uh, and thank you. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Justin John for the invitation to uh, speak at, uh, at this exciting symposium. And I also wanna give a shout out to uh, my old PhD supervisor, I think is in the crowd, Dr. Kerry Kernier. So I finished my, uh, my PhD with Carrie, gosh, I think it's almost 20 years ago now. So I think that means uh, I'm getting a little bit older as well. <clears throat> so Justin, he sent me the, uh, the list of topics being presented today. And, and it was clear that uh, I knew you were going to get some excellent information regarding the latest evidence and issues around exercise and cancer. And you certainly got that from Dr. Ligabel's talk and Dr. Kurnier's discussion. So I wanted to talk uh, about something a little bit different. I wanted to get us thinking about the samples that we recruit into our exercise and cancer studies and the generalizability of these samples to broader populations of cancer survivors. It's difficult to determine how many exercise interventions for cancer survivors are published right now. Uh, the last um, key Cochrane reviews were published, I believe, in 2016 and 2018. And I know combined that those two reviews reported on just over 100 studies. I suspect that number is higher now. But the field is now too large to analyze and report on the entire body of literature. So reviews now are taking a more nuanced and, and detailed approach and specifically focusing on different characteristics, including timing, so say during and after treatment. They're looking at different exercise types. So for example, aerobic and resistance training. They're looking at different cancer types, so breast or colorectal or lymphomas. And they're looking at different outcomes. So we're seeing reviews that are specifically looking at cancer-related fatigue or cardiorespiratory fitness and different cancer outcomes. So these reviews and meta-analyses, what they do is they pool data and they've cons consistently found that exercise is safe, feasible and beneficial for certain outcomes. So as a result of the pooling of data, these generalized exercise guidelines have emerged and Dr. Ligabel uh, presented uh, a, a recent set of guidelines that were published uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. So here's a, a, uh, some images of some other recent reviews that, that have been published or some other uh, some guidelines that have been published. And I suspect most of you are familiar with, with these different papers. So we're now starting to see some cancer specific guidelines that are focused on a particular cancer type. So for example, the one published by uh, my old lab mate, Dr. Kristen Campbell at, at UBC, who uh, her and her uh, pool of experts looked at exercise uh, for people who have bone metastases. So while the body of literature supports the role of exercise across the cancer continuum, the challenge has now moved from examining the effectiveness of exercise interventions in small groups or small study samples and translating these research findings so that all cancer patients and survivors can learn about and engage in exercise. So the question becomes, to what degree can we take the results of published studies and translate those findings into exercise guidelines for cancer survivors? And to start to answer that question, 
first, I think we need to take a closer look at the studies. So I want to uh, define generalizability for you. Generalizability, I think, is best defined as a question. And the question is, how confidently can we extend the results of our sample of cancer survivors to the larger population of cancer survivors of which that sample was drawn from? To ensure that an internally valid effect in a clinical exercise trial is an unbiased estimate of the true intervention effect in a target population, we need to take measures to ensure that people in this, the study sample closely resemble those from their larger target population. We wanna be confident that we can extend the results from our relatively small sample, whether that's 50, 100, or 150 people, to that larger, larger target population of whatever uh, population of cancer survivors we're looking at. In reality, we, we can't study the entire population, it's too large. So we look at that smaller sample that we recruit into our clinical trial. And to enhance the degree to which the results of a study can be generalized to a target population, this smaller sample should be selected randomly from the study population. And those selected should also be representative of the target population. But in practice, random sampling, as we all know, uh, is very difficult to execute. And as researchers and, and clinical trial coordinators and conductors, we're faced with challenges associated with recruiting from target populations and certain researcher imposed design restrictions, such as recruiting from a single site or selecting only members of the target population that have certain characteristics. So for example, perhaps uh, we're, we're only looking at patients who have early stage disease, but not advanced cancer. So many trials are at a high risk of recruiting a sample that is systematically different from, and therefore not representative of its target population. And this sampling bias can lead to systematic errors in the results of studies and limit the generalizability of study findings to the larger or the more broader target population. And here's just uh, one study example. So generalizing the results of a, a single study is complex. It's, it's something that we typically all do. But when a researcher makes a generalizability claim, what we're doing is we're extrapolating beyond the data and making predictions about people or interventions, settings, or cancer-related outcomes that we haven't really observed directly. And here's a good example of what we often see in the literature. It's, it's quite common to, common to make a, a generalizability statement uh, near the end of that discussion section in our manuscripts. So this is one uh, recent uh, uh, exercise trial that had a sample of uh, 100 survivors who were immediately post-adjuvant treatment. And here we're seeing their generalizations being made to all post-adjuvant survivors, as well as those going through treatment. So myself and my colleague from uh, the UK, uh, specifically Birmingham, Dr. Ian Lahart, uh, we've been exploring study sample characteristics across exercise and specifically breast cancer studies. And I want to show you some of our findings about how relevant sample characteristics of published studies call into question the certainty by which it can be claimed that the effects of exercise observed in women with breast cancer participating in trials can be extrapolated to the general uh, breast cancer population. So specifically, I want to explore how differences in age, trial location, that is the country that the trial is being conducted in, uh, the ethnicity of the samples, comorbidities, cancer stage, and treatments received, how these different factors can potentially lead to differential effects of exercise and consequence, consequently limit the generalizability of the results of exercise interventions in women with with, with breast cancer. So the first one's age. So we found breast cancer survivors in published trials tended to be younger compared to the general population, the, the general breast cancer survivor population. The average age in the two Cochrane reviews I referred to earlier 
was just over 50 years. So that's the average age of all the uh, women participating in the, in the studies or the trials that were included in those Cochrane reviews. And what we found is these average ages are not necessarily representative of breast cancer age at in, breast cancer incidence rates or the age that uh, when people are diagnosed with breast cancer, what's the average age? So data from Global Can in 2018 indicated that in, in Canada, the USA and the UK, over half of new breast cancer cases are actually 65 years of age or older. And only 20% are under the age of 50 years, which is pretty much the average age of survivors that we found in those two Cochrane reviews. So we can conclude what we can con conclude from this is that older survivors are very much underrepresented in our studies. The lower number of older women in exercise and cancer trials is important because there's evidence that patients who are aged 70 years of age or older treated with breast surgery and adjuvant hormonal therapy experience a greater decline in physical function between one and two years after diagnosis compared to survivors who are younger. And furthermore, older patients with cancer are a more heterogeneous population than younger patients. And they present with a variety of comorbidities. So for example, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and arthritis. They also have different symptom syndromes such as sarcopenia and frailty that need to be considered. Uh, they may have functional impairments and they have differing social support systems which could and, and, and might influence exercise prescription and affect various uh, biochemical, physiological, or psychosocial responses to exercise. So generalizing the results of exercise trials with younger breast cancer survivors to older survivors should be treated with caution. So given the negative physical and emotional effects of surgery and adjuvant therapies, the rising age profile of breast cancer survivors and the low number of older women in the breast cancer exercise literature, there is certainly a need for future well-designed trials to elucidate the safety and feasibility of exercise among older breast cancer survivors. So in those two Cochrane reviews in 2018 and 2016, they analyzed 118 unique trials. 86% of these trials were conducted in either North America, Europe, Australia, and Canada. Of the remaining trials, only 12% took place across six different Asian countries. 6% were in India and South Korea. And despite Asia being home to approximately 60% of the world's population. Only one trial each originated from Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. Most trials took place in either high income or upper middle income countries, and none were based in low income countries, according to the World Bank taxonomy. So keep in mind the data from these reviews are a few years old, 2016 and 18. So there's certainly uh, there might be some research activity coming out of some of these countries since that time. Uh, so for example, I'm aware of uh, the Habit B study coming out of Japan, as well as the FizCan trial coming out of, out of Sweden. So some countries with particularly high incidences and prevalence of breast cancer, and on the image here, those are the darker green countries. Uh, for example, Argentina, Belgium, Sweden, Brazil, China, France, Japan, they're particularly underrepresented in the exercise oncology literature. And research in each of these countries is important because the demographic and cancer characteristics of women with breast cancer might vary across countries and which in turn can influence the generalizability of study trial results. While there's certainly a lack of ethnic diversity among women in published studies, um, the true extent of the lack of ethnic diversity is unclear due to actual poor reporting of ethnicity across exercise oncology trials. It's surprising when we found that only 28% and 48% of trials included in the two recent Cochrane reviews reported 
the ethnicity of their sample. There's a new acronym actually that is gaining steam. Some of you might have heard from it. Studies that are lacking diverse samples are being called weird studies, W-E-I-R-D. So in weird studies, participants are mostly uh, Western, they're educated, they're from industrialized, rich, and democratic countries. The lack of ethnic minority representation in exercise oncology trials is concerning given the evidence of health disparities between those who are white and those who are of ethnic minority. So previous studies, including those based on the SEER database, S-E-E-R, have consistently shown that despite having lower incidence rates for breast cancer, black women in the USA, for example, have a higher mortality rate from breast cancer compared to white women. And similar dis disparities have been found in the UK when comparing white to black and Asian women. So the reasons for these discrepancies are not entirely clear, but they're likely to be multifactorial with contributing factors such as biological differences. So for example, genetic susceptibility and tumor characteristics uh, might be due to disproportionate number of comorbidities, uh, less access to equitable care, socioeconomic deprivation, and even poor lifestyle characteristics. But it's probable that these disparities could lead to differential effects of exercise between white and ethnic minority women with breast cancer. Exercise trials risk further exacerbating these disparities by not actively seeking ways to involve ethnic minorities in potential health promoting interventions, investigating barriers to engaging in healthy lifestyle behaviors, and studying possible differential responses to exercise in these groups. And that's not to say that recruiting more ethnic, ethnically diverse samples will be easy, it's not. Previous research has identified ethnic minority patient barriers such as a mistrust in med, uh, medical researchers, a fear of randomization to experimentation or a control group, and logistical issues, including language, uh, transportation, and financial barriers. So research is needed to find strategies to overcome these barriers to engaging ethnic minorities in exercise oncology studies. And this is why it's so important to have research groups across the world, like here in South Korea, engaging in meaningful research to broaden the scope of our understanding of the role of exercise among uh, cancer survivors. The presence of comorbidities in women with or who have had breast cancer is an important prognostic factor. Surprisingly, most studies that were reported in the Cochrane reviews, they did not do a particularly good job at reporting baseline comorbidity data. Uh, in Ian LaHart's Cochrane review, only 14 studies actually reported comorbidity information at baseline. Uh, most post adjuvant participants. Uh, in Ian LaHart's uh, meta-analysis had a BMI between 18 and a half and under and 29.9. So they were a normal or overweight uh, classification based on BMI. Similarly, in an individual patient data meta-analysis uh, that was done by Lorraine Buffart and her colleagues in the Netherlands, they did a meta-analysis of 34 randomized controlled trials. 22% of patients in that meta-analysis were classified as obese, according to uh, body mass index. We know that breast cancer survivors with obesity and having at least four comorbidities have a greater risk of functionally limiting chemotherapy toxicities. They also have a greater risk of reduced dosing of chemotherapy and a higher frequency of chemotherapy delays and interruptions compared to patients who are not obese and they have fewer comorbidities. So it's likely that the generalization of findings from non-obese women with fewer comorbidities may not be advisable and differential exercise prescriptions may be required for these populations. In fact, one previous meta-analysis reported in a subgroup analysis that 
cancer survivors with higher BMI experienced less favorable effects of exercise on physical and psychosocial measures. There are studies that have specifically looked at women who are overweight or obese. And Dr. Ligabel uh, outlined uh, one of the ones that they're re recently doing. But certainly more work still needs to be done. Uh, it's very common, and uh, I've, I've done it in the past, it's common to exclude those uh, individuals with multiple comorbidities, especially comorbidities that are heart related, uh, as well as those in the upper classes of obesity. So say class two, class three obesity uh, with respect to BMI. So a question to consider, are we sacrificing the generalizability of the intervention by adopting stricter inclusion and exclusion criteria? So the last factor I wanna talk about is cancer stage and treatments received. Um, it's no surprise that in the literature, most patients and survivors included in studies have or were diagnosed with stages one to three breast cancer. Of studies that included both lower and advanced stage survivors, only 19% of survivors were advanced stage. But we know that upwards of 30% of newly diagnosed survivors will at some point become metastatic. So we wanna caution against making generalizations from studies including predominantly patients with early stage disease. Regardless of the strength of individual studies, generalizing exercise intervention results from early stage breast cancer survivors to those with advanced stage breast cancer could be problematic given the different disease profiles, different treatment trajectories, and adverse health outcomes associated with these treatments. Uh, disease stage and treatment received may indeed have an impact on how a breast cancer survivor responds to exercise therapy. There may be several issues leading to low numbers of those with advanced cancer in our studies. And I'm certainly not implicating or implying researchers are not making an effort to include those with advanced disease. More intensive treatments such as multiple rounds of taxane-based chemotherapy are associated with adverse physiological and psychosocial outcomes to a greater degree compared to patients only receiving, for example, surgery or surgery and radiation therapy. And these individuals with advanced disease, they may be very apprehensive about adding an exercise trial into their cancer journey. And given these factors, guidelines derive primarily from early stage cancer survivors. We need to take caution to not generalize to survivors with advanced disease. So just to wrap up, there are certainly other sample factors that may also be just as important. So for example, different cancer subtypes. Um, the education of uh, our cancer samples, and even other socioeconomic factors, as well as relevant intervention, setting, and outcome factors. But based on the variables and the information I've presented in these slides, I encourage more research to focus on older patients and older survivors with breast cancer, women with advanced cancer and those with comorbidities, and women from ethnic minorities and from underrepresented countries. The main limitation of my arguments is the specific focus on breast cancer studies, but this highlights another generalizability concern we see in our field. Sometimes I think we assume exercise is safe in other lesser studied cancers, primarily based on the information that we have that's come from primarily the breast cancer literature. We still have very few quality exercise interventions in cancer groups, such as, for example, kidney, ovarian, or other gynecological cancers, lung cancer, brain cancer, and different lymphomas. And Dr. Kearney mentioned he wasn't sure if we can claim exercise is good for all patients, and we need to specific, specifically explore the role of exercise in these lesser studied cancers. So we can make claims specifically about those populations from studies that are conducted in those populations. Um, inter interventions are certainly happening in these lesser studied uh, cancers, but still the primarily focus in our field, I think appears to still be on breast cancer. And we acknowledge that studying the effects of exercise in harder to recruit 
and smaller subpopulations of survivors prevents a, a, a serious challenge. And I think it's one that requires larger and more innovative collaborations and a greater collegial effort to recruit patients from multiple sites and not just single sites across the world and switch towards slower and more deliberate science. That includes more del deliberate recruitment strategies so that we can get a wider range of breast cancer survivors or cancer survivors in general into our studies. And I think these strategies would aid in enhancing the generalizability of exercise trials while minimizing the threats to internal validity. So just a, a thank you slide. That's my email address there. I'm certainly happy to respond to any emails. This is an image of uh, where I live. I live in British Columbia, and this is an image uh, taken obviously in the summertime. I think like you were in the midst of winter. So the mountains in the back, that's the Rocky Mountains. They're actually all covered in snow right now. So, um, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you uh, once again for the invite to speak at the symposium. Um, unfortunately, I can't stay for the entire symposium. It's uh, 7.30, so I have, I have three kids that I have to help uh, get to bed. Uh, so thank you again uh, to all of you and uh, good luck for the rest of the symposium.